address. Let me do some short introductions and then fuller introductions one by one when people, when people speak. But thinking what, what the issues are we have to consider, certainly the future of freedom and the future of pluralism. Can we go on existing as a multi-faith society where Jews, Muslims, Christians, people of no faith find a safe <coughs> public square in which to live and encounter each other and learn from each other and grow through each other, that's the ideal. Or have levels of threat and fear begun to undermine that so seriously that we worry about its very future. And um, we have with us Dr. John Boyd from uh, JPR um, and, and you're going to talk a little bit later about some of the research you've done on anti-Semitism and what trends it shows and the hopes for the future. Sukhra, Sukhra Ahmed, we met through your work with the Wolf Institute in Cambridge in, um, in particularly Jewish-Muslim, but also Jewish-Muslim Christian relations. Um, Dilwa, we met again recently, Dilwa Hussein, you're very interested in the manner of interpreting religious text. You almost pick up exactly where everyone finished, actually, in how challenging religious texts can be brought into the life of a modern, pluralist, democratic state. And Morris, can't really, it's hard to think of you, Lord Glassman, a Labour peer, you're in a way at the political edge of, of these issues. We haven't, in fact, even worked out an order of speaking, but Shukran, you did say you'd quite like to go first, so I think we should, we should accord you that, um, that privilege. And my suggestion is we go from you to John, and then, and then Dilwa and, and, and Morris. And I ask people to speak you know, relatively briefly for, for up to six or seven minutes, and then I'm going to try and draw our participants into a dialogue between one another, and then we'll open it up to everybody, aiming if people are concerned about it, to finish it about half past nine or just after, and then allow some time for people to chat one to one. So we need to, I think, hold this quite close. Shukra. I should introduce you actually more. I'm sorry, it's a very stingy introduction, but um, you were a trustee of the Interfaith Network and a president of the Islamic Society of Britain. Your programs manager at the Wolf Institute, and I know that you've been particularly concerned, for example, with the area of medicine and interfaith work and hospice care and, and um, some of the, the gentler and tenderer sides of life as well as the lives of faith. Thank you very much. And a very good evening to you all. Thank you for having me here. Um, can everybody hear me? Yes. No. Okay, <coughs> It feels very close <laughs> um, Okay, so I, um, as per Jonathan's request, um, that I couldn't say no to really because he's Jonathan and Tim Burton. Um, I wanted to share with you a few thoughts on how things have been going these last few weeks. I'm sure we all have um, strong thoughts about that. Uh, it's been a very interesting week this week, especially because we've got um, Holocaust Memorial Day, a very special one this year. Um, but just, just focusing on what has happened in uh, Paris and since then, um, most of us are offended each and every day by all sorts of things, by pornography, by violence, by evangelism or atheism, by advertising or trans comments from political figures. In expressing our offence, we clarify what matters most to us, our values. Sometimes by opening our hearts and minds to others, we can even change our opinions about others and allow them to change their opinions about us. The question is whether freedom and pluralism can engage in a way that protects us all from intolerance, violence and hate, wherever that may come from. So, in these last weeks, we felt many, many different emotions. Possibly emotions that we didn't really recognize in ourselves, strong emotions. For me, just reflecting on what happened in Paris, and sadly, so many other occasions similar to that, I felt a betrayal of my faith. As I'm sure you've heard many Muslims say, personally and publicly. And I felt that betrayal because people murdered in the name, and hurt and injured in the name of God our God, 
And I know this because they shout words like Allah Akbar, which means God is great in Arabic. Now, I feel a sense of hurt when God is subjected to an assault and this type of what I consider blasphemy. I was, at an, I was chairing an event yesterday um, for the Wolf, Wolf Institute, um, a panel discussion where Ron Williams said, the attempt to defend God by stepping up the cycle of hostility to the nightmare level that we have seen simply locks God into human fear and rivalry. And for me that meant that God is much bigger, much greater, um, omnipresent if you like. And for, for people, for human beings who claim to follow his, his wisdom, his guidance and his teachings in whatever way they choose, but then utilize that understanding in such an ugly and horrific way, it's nothing less than a blasphemy to say that God wants this. I am doing this for God. In fact, it's my sacrifice for God feels wrong, utterly wrong. Acts of unity have encouraged me to consider my own role in the struggle against this tyranny and to, and to promote freedoms, whether it's the, the freedom to offend or any other kind of freedom. We saw in Paris, in France, millions of people come together, including heads of state. We saw groups of Muslims display signs of love on the French embassy here, right here in London, straight after the attacks. And we've heard the defiant response from everyday French people, in fact, everyday British people, from all walks <coughs> of life against these murders and against this kind of ideology. And quite rightly, as, as we heard earlier, this, this interpretation of text um, that seems so horrific and horrendous to us. But there are moments of hope, I think. In addition to the Wolf Institute event yesterday, the Three Faiths Forum collaborated with a number of organisations, including the Islamic Society of Britain. And over the weekend, we had a film showing of the film Besa. Besa is um, it's a, it's a film about Algerians who protected uh, Jewish people during World War II. But Besa, as a word in itself, means promise. A promise that is so is so heavy. <coughs> that it must be delivered at any cost. And so, I mean, I'd encourage any of you to watch that film um, and, and, and to see it for yourself, but it's very moving. And at the end of this event, we had a declaration signed by all sorts of different people uh, of faith and no faith from different walks of life. And that, seeing people walk up to that declaration, a big piece of paper in the middle of the room and sign that, was a real act of unity, a real act of togetherness for me. Granted, in a safe space, in a country where we have the freedom to do that, not everybody does. But the humanity that I saw was very inspirational. So along with a number of other women, Muslim and Jewish women, I've made a pledge to work on at least two collaborations a year between Muslim and Jewish communities. There's a fear that the price we, the ordinary person, the ordinary people will pay in responding to this terror is actually a, a curtailment, some would say even a further curtailment of our freedom and our liberty in the name of security. And we heard earlier how um, the French Prime Minister responded to the call for Jewish, French Jews to come to Israel uh, to be safe in Israel and the implication there is that they cannot be safe anywhere else. A frightening, a frightening thought for any community. Jewish or otherwise, to feel that strong sense of fear that actually they, they need to migrate to a different part of the world in order to feel safe. We also heard Theresa May, I think, uh, earlier this week, say that she'd never thought that she would see the day where British Jews would feel unsafe. And I think many of us echo that sentiment. Intolerance and hate can manifest in all sorts of different forms and this must be recognised and tackled by not only those who are directly impacted by, all of it, by, by this, but all of us as brothers and sisters in humanity. Often it's the community affected most that needs others to speak up against hate. This is a powerful way of civil society coming together to tackle prejudice and xenophobia by connecting our principles with our practice. And often you, 
as a Muslim, when, when awful things happen, places of worship are attacked, people are attacked, wherever that may happen in the world. And we hear publicly, and I imagine there are many, many more voices that, that echo the sentiment privately, but when we hear publicly that actually this is wrong, it makes Muslims, I think, feel confident and safer than in the absence of that voice. And I think the same has to be the other way around, or whichever community is under attack. So when Jewish communities are under attack, attack, it's important for Muslim communities and others to stand up and say, no, this is wrong, and we will deal with this. But some would argue that there's a poverty of engagement, that we don't engage enough, despite the examples that I've shared, very recent examples, that there is a poverty of engagement which breeds suspicion, breeds stereotypes, negative stereotypes, <coughs> preju prejudice of the other, and increases the feeling of being under siege. I think we heard the, the, earlier the feeling of fear and the way that the speaker described that sense of fear. People can't go to school without being escorted. It doesn't sound like France. It doesn't sound like Paris. <coughs> but there are examples, and we must focus on those examples, where Jews and Muslims, for example, can be seen to be engaging in innovative ways here in Britain, a free society. I just want to end on the idea that, and many people have talked about this after the cartoons, that freedom doesn't necessarily equal aggressive liberty. Freedom is to move from free speech to good speech. And good speech is all about being adult-like adult, adult in your communication. And to be adult-like in our communication, I think we need literacy about others, literacy of those we don't know. We need to find out what's important to them, what gives <coughs> meaning to them, and what we can mean to each other. Thank you very much. And I know you really mean every word you say because you are and have been engaged in making those links and working alongside your own and the Jewish and the Jewish community. And. Uh, but we'll pick up later, I think, with others on some of the phrases like poverty of engagement and what that might, might mean. And also promoting freedom, including the freedom to offend, and at what point that crosses lines. So things for later. Meanwhile, John, Dr. John Boyd, you are a member of this congregation and a good friend. I think of you as in that capacity, but you're executive di um, director of the Jewish Policy research, the independent London-based body that has produced reports including, including really on anti-Semitism in Europe and that's one of the key factors that has brought you to this panel now. But I asked you as well as looking at the difficult side of what is to ask questions about the challenges and how we may meet them in the time ahead. Thank you. Um, everybody. Um, I, uh, I should start by saying actually I really, I, I really struggled with um, what to say this evening. Um, I actually prepared two different things, um, and uh, in the end, I think I'm going to take a bit from both of them. So I don't know how coherent this is going to be. But we'll give it a go. Um, let me start by saying a few words about anti-Semitism because because uh, Jonathan asked me to, to do that, and as you may have noticed, anti-Semitism has been in the news a little bit in the last couple of weeks. Um, the interesting thing I think about it is that there have been two kind of competing messages coming out of the, uh, out of the, the, the discourse within the Jewish community about anti-Semitism. Sorry. Um, on the one hand, we've heard kind of um, like almost sort of shrill screams and sensationalism coming out of the, um, the Campaign Against Anti-Semitism survey, um, which I have to say was based on dubious research data um, and I think incorrectly concluded that anti-Semitic anti ideas are like almost endemic within British society <laughs> and that a large proportion of British Jews is thinking about leaving. Um, that sort of stuff, I mean, it's, it, it's, it, it's sensationalist and quite frankly it's nonsense. Um, at the levels of antipathy towards Jews in this country are amongst the lowest in the world and have remained at a low level about 5 to 10 percent for the best part of 25 years. Um, they've been pretty constant over that period. Um, British Jews are not there's, there's no indication that British Jews are about to up and leave 
Uh, the number of people who make Aliyah uh, to every year is about 500 to 600. That's about 0.2% of the British Jewish population. And of course, many of them don't go because they're fleeing from anti-Semitism. They go for positive reasons because they want to live a more fulfilling Jewish life there. So, um, so, uh, and actually, the other thing I would add is that um, the, the data we have from from census indicates that more Jews are moving to Britain from the rest of the world generally than leaving. Um, so uh, uh, that's kind of important context, and that's certainly been one of the voices I think that's been uh, that's, that's, that's been expressed. On the other hand, I think we've also heard. Um, sort of voices of too much complacency, um, those arguing that Britain's a great place to be Jewish, the small amount of anti-Semitism that exists is largely in response to the behaviour of the Israeli government, and that those who are shouting and screaming about it are crying wolf. Um, I think there's the big, that, that uh, expression as well. I think that's also an inaccurate read of reality. Um, there's going to be a report that the CST are bringing out in next week, which will very clearly show that there was a huge spike in the number of, of anti-Semitic incidents in 2014. Um, and that spike was largely due to incidents that happened in the context, in, during the summer in the context of the war in Gaza. Um, and that spike is, 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 is responsible really for making 2014 one of the worst years on record for anti-Semitic incidents. Um, and I have to say, I feel like the, the idea that the actions of the Israeli government should lead to anti-Semitic harassment or uh, vandalism or violence on the streets of Britain, uh, and that the Israeli government in some way holds responsibility for that, seems to me to be erroneous. I think people who, who perpetrate anti-Semitic acts are responsible for those acts, and they should be held accountable for them. Um, we should be concerned about the spikes in anti-Semitic incidents that occur when things kick off in Israel. There, um, you know, those events are being used as an excuse to express views in violent and aggressive ways against the people that's being targeted simply because they're Jewish. Um, mm -hmm. that, antagon that antagonism comes from um, from various parts of British society, but. Statistically, uh, and however politically incorrect it may be to say this, and I thought long and hard about should I say this here or not, um, I'm going to say, <laughs> statistically, it's, the truth is that the antagonism towards Jews in British society is more likely to come from Muslims than from non-Muslims, um, even though Muslims constitute about 5% of the population uh, of Britain. Um, and that, by the way, comes from two key sources. One is one is uh, Jewish data. One is data that, that I was involved in gathering and analysing um, that was commissioned by the European Union, which said, which asked Jewish victims of anti-Semitic incidents who was the perpetrator of those incidents, and the group they identified more than any other in terms of religious or, or political affiliation was sort of people with Muslim extremist views. Um, and also um, looking at data from um, from the Pew Research Centre um, in the, in the states, just a lot of a lot of attitudinal data. Um, they've sh they've shown that um, on a sort of a scale of uh, the question is to what it's to asked of British adults generally, do you do you hold favourable to very very favourable to very unfavourable views of Jews in Britain? Um, the percentage of British adults who hold very unfavourable views towards Jews in Britain is 3%. Um, but within that 3%, um, Muslims account, Muslim adults account for more than half of it. Um, again, you know, even though they're 5% they're of the population. So, you know, there, there's, from a Jewish perspective, you know, you, we can be, on the one hand, we can read the data as actually low, levels of anti-Semitism are very low in Britain, and British adults generally feel very positively towards Jews, and by the way, Reasonably positively towards Israel as well, um, but um, but uh, you know I think at a certain point and perhaps particularly at the moment, um, again however politically incorrect it feels or however uncomfortable it feels, you know I think we have to be clear that that a, a considerable proportion of that antipathy comes from the Muslim community. I, w I want to be clear. Um, I want to state very clearly that you know over half of um, again looking at Pew data over half of. Muslims in Britain either hold favourable views or have no particular opinion at all, but at the same time, a much higher proportion of Muslims in this country uh, don't like views than than average, um, and that's an, and that's an issue, and that's a problem. I think you know, I think we need to state it, and I think we need to address it. Um, uh, okay, so that was uh, that was from talk number one. Um, <laughs> um, <laughs> okay.
Um, all right, so let, let, me, let me try and say a word. I want to say a word that's about freedom, actually, um, and, uh, and a sort of a response to, uh, uh, or actually really just to think about, to think about freedom. Um, and I hope, I hope I can do this in two or three minutes, I'll try. Um, freedom's a big word. Um, and I, when I think about sort of big values, I'm, I, I, I often think about Michael Walzer, the political scientist book, thick, um, his book Thick and Thin. Um, and key part of the thesis there is that when we think about um, when we think about the term or the idea of freedom in what he calls the thin sense, everyone agrees. Like freedom, um, uh, freedom as an example. Um, in a thin sense, is kind of who you know, we're all we're all in favour, right? Freedom, freedom's a good thing. Everybody should be free. <laughs> we want people to be free. That's uh, you know that's when we talk in that way. That's the kind of that's what he means by the thin sense of freedom. Um, but what he says is that when you get into the complexity of freedom, when you get into the detail of freedom. How do we make people free? What do what methods? Are we, what do we really mean by freedom? That's when differences of opinion um, uh, come into play. And, um, and you know, in, in certain instances, those differences of opinion, even though we might agree with, we agree with each other in terms of a thin definition, uh, differences of opinion in terms of what we really mean can lead to murder, and do indeed do so. And I think that's part of what happened um, at Charlie Hebdo and Paris a few weeks ago. You know, the cartoonists believed that they should be free to say whatever they want, however they want to say it. They believed in freedom of speech, freedom of expression, freedom to criticise, freedom to shock, freedom to laugh at that which they considered to be absurd or object. Um, they sought a society that was free from coercion, free from interference, free from anything that constrained their right to say and to draw whatever they damn well like. Um, their critics, on the other hand, from their perspective, uh, believe that they should be free from humiliation, free from blasphemy, free to live their lives without wider society poking fun at their beliefs, at their beliefs freedom to fulfil their religious sensibilities in the context of respect. Um, now, and the vast majority, of course, of these critics don't subsequently go on to murder people in cold blood, but some do, as was clearly apparent um, in Paris. Um, and that's kind of the irony. You know, everyone is talking about freedom, and everybody wants freedom, but the differences in what we mean by it can lead to terrorism and cold-blooded murder. Um, we Jews know a little bit about freedom. Um, you know, actually, the, 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 what, the, the ritual that we practice more, uh, more commonly than any other, which is attending a Pesach Seder, by the way, um, is a celebration of freedom. Um, and I think it's interesting, it contains within it um, both of these kind of conflicting notions of freedom and the tension that exists between them. So a key element of the, of the Saviour is what Isaiah Berlin called negative freedom. <coughs> People are familiar with that article, uh, Two Concepts of Liberty, classic article from the 50s. Um, negative freedom is like freedom from something. So in the context of a Saviour, freedom from slavery imposed by a hostile, aggressive power bent on humiliation and degradation. But the Seder also contains what he calls positive freedom, which is the freedom to do something, the freedom to live our lives as we wish, to celebrate our Judaism and freedom, to aspire to the eternal hope of next year in Jerusalem. Um, and we actually experience the tension between those two concepts of liberty, those two concepts of freedom, sort of both literally and virtually when we open the door at the, at the, at during the Pesach Seder. We kind of, we, we open the door, we, we, we ritually, we pour out our wrath on the hostile world that humiliates us and kills us. But we also <coughs> open the door to invite all who are hungry to come in and eat in a sort of ritualizing enactment of how we should use our freedom to create a better and more just world. Um, and I, I, I really love that about Judaism. Uh, I think we've got, we probably have more reason than most to be angry at the world. Um, you know, I think yesterday's commemoration service serves as a pretty stark reminder of that, and I think we also have more reason than most to wish for a world in which we can finally be true to ourselves, whether it's the subject of history rather than the object of history. Um, okay, I have to, I have to yeah, I have to be to shut up. Um, so I, I, fundamentally, I think what I want to say is that, um, is that I think, I think because, perhaps because of our our understanding of freedom, perhaps because of our experience of freedom, and perhaps because of the way we have 
learnt to ritualise it and express our frustrations and emotions through ritual rather than often through, through violence. I think we have something to teach. I think we have something to teach ourselves. I think we have something to teach other minorities. And I also think we have something to teach British society. I'm happy to talk about more of that when we get to the discussion, please. <laughs> that was excellent. And you, you, you put on the table some difficult things in a very, uh, in a very respectful manner, but there, there remain difficult things for us to think about and not to ignore. But you also talked about different ways in which we can grapple with freedom and, and manage, perhaps, different facets of it. So things to come back to as well, uh, as well later.